All right, welcome again to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. What are we talking about today, Shamo? Well, it depends on what order we want to go into. Uh, we have to do our review of the finale for season two. Ugh, nothing worse than a subpar climax, let me tell you. No, no giggity Sub at all. Subpar? This is like the underneath this the water in the Titanic. It was horrible. Uh and we also had some social issues to talk about. Uh, you yeah, I, which one? Well, let's. Uh, Do we want to get warmed up with social issues? Let's let's get warmed up with the social issues. I was actually thinking that uh, when I watched it last night, it was so bad. I thought, you know, it's a good thing we're we're at the end of Winter's Heart, which is a really good climax. Giggity. Uh, we can compare and contrast. And then I thought, no, I don't want to do the 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 prime watt episode the same day as the actual wheel of time episode because that'll just bring me down because it's it's a really good finale winter's heart is i think one of the better finales and it, it's a really quite a contrast this one was just what what is going on speaking of what is going on let, let me start with the social because i'm curious what where you were going to go but you said you had some ranting about kindy uh and uh, that i've, kind I've of got thing. i've got a couple of things and they all could be connected uh, well, it's Kindy. It's uh, one of the it's the chapter I'm on in theories of human development, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, the, the social role theory. Uh, and they, they decided to basically make half the chapter about gender when it could have been anything social. And so we know the pressure is there. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also had oh something related to that from uh, my. This one, this one, let's actually, we could start with this one uh, okay. when it's my turn, because it's it's going to be the shortest one. It's something worrisome that was in my little sexual misconduct uh, module uh -huh. that I alluded to in, in our uh -huh. last Wheel of Time episode. No, this is actually, it's all connected, though. All right. Well, I have I have a uh, CRT related thought that's been bubbling around in my head that kind of popped up again last night because I was going through. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. Oh, uh, um, go ahead. So I, I was going through my, my subscriptions, watching things, and I haven't watched this guy in a bit. Uh, it's a cool little channel called Echo Chamberlain. Uh, he's cheating because he's British, so he, he is obviously smarter than we are, but annoyingly sounds way smarter than we are. And... So the, the title of this video, video uh, Identity Junkies, and this is something that I've been kicking around in general, is this the this idol of identity. And and as, as Peterson has been pointing out, it's not real identity because identity is something from, what is it, like age three or four that you start negotiating your identity in society, in your social circle. Because it, it it's a it's a give and take. It's not just a uh, uh, which is the it, good part of the chapter social role. Okay, theory. so yeah. I'm actually <laughs> on on tap here. But th this is what's interesting to me. So specifically, what he's focusing on. I don't know if you're familiar with any of these things that he's talking about. But this is this is Anne Boleyn, uh, played by a very black actress. Uh, and I don't remember what I don't remember if this was a Netflix or what. Um, but he also uh, brings up Cleopatra, uh, the that you know bombed, uh, but they were it, the the makers were insistent on making it, um, making her black African rather than uh, uh, Ptolemaic Greek. Um, he brings up this silly BBC cartoon where they they took this very thin bit of evidence of of a. Uh, an Ethiopian uh, uh, legionnaire and said, oh, so Britain has always been multicultural. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> he, he brings up the memes. It, it's great putting side by side Witcher, Rings of Power, uh, Wheel of Time. They all look exactly the same in their diversity. They all look generically bland. It's like a United Colors of Benetton if you're old like us. And and we used to make fun of those because that's what those ads were like. And it's instead, it's just making it very bland. As he points out, if 
if everyone is from everywhere, then everyone is no from nowhere and everyone is no one. You know, there is no identity here. But but here's the the curious thing to me about this new trend in uh reimagining historical dramas or even documentaries or you know faux documentaries where where there's this diversity of casting there was this kind of overcorrection not that long ago from things like the lost cause that that was apologetic of the confederacy in the south and and uh, conservatives were guilty of this too because they they kind of overcorrected by pointing out that despite now what they were trying to do is point out how great america was that despite the discrimination against uh blacks especially but other minorities they still had a better lot in life than the overwhelming majority of people around the world but it 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 often went too far and tended to ignore that base discrimination well then there was this overcorrection in the 60s and 70s where you had to self-flagellate and constantly dwell on the darkness and the discrimination and the failures of the past and that's all we could talk about and that's all we could dwell on in saying how crappy we we are as a country and as a society but now it's gone 180 what is it with this CRT insanity that has completely flipped that over to say, we're not going to self-flagellate anymore. Instead, we're going to reimagine history. Did I just put that in right as you said that? (laughs) Speaking of reimagining history. Oh dear. What is this simply the, logical conclusion to the irrationality of crt or is this because you've read their books i mean you've read their literal textbooks they're, they're actually up right behind yeah here. It, is this actually part of the undoing of of white colonial patriarchy is this somehow part of the process or is this simply the the uh rational conclusion of their irrationality well that depends on which scholar you're talking about because there's the true believers there's the grifters and then there's the stupid people Mm. there's a difference between those three things uh we've got one of the grifters up here which we'll talk about in a second which is kendi and kendi and then we've got uh the 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 grifters off the grifter grifters with his uh conceptual james there with cynical theories Rules for Radicals, who was one of the geniuses and true believers. And then we got sports nutrition because it's all bullshit. Uh, Yes, that was on purpose before I knew everything you were going to talk about. So it was purposefully accidental. (laughs) But uh, but yeah. uh, There are people who see this as an avenue to everything they speak against. We're talking about the 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 founders of BLM who have basically made themselves incredibly wealthy on the backs of everybody that is uh, for real or for for not the victims of this. There's both. And the problem is they perpetuate the victimhood of the ones that are the real victims in order to keep their grift up. So there's those. Hindi is part of that. I'm, I'm going to put him in that group. Uh, and you'll see why when we rant here in a second. Uh, there's the Sololinskis who actually think they're they're causing uh, real change. And I'm going to put someone like Cornell West into that group. Although there's a big hubbub about, and this, this one's one of the hard ones to parse out because it, is it the media talking or is it the actual truth that he's, now that he's switched from Green Party to Independent, this all was a grift from the beginning to get more people to buy his books, but that's just how they talk about people they don't like too. So we'll see. We'll see on that one. Uh, what was the third group? The idiots. Yes, Kindy is also in this group. Uh, he's in both because he's a person that wanted to be in the smart people trying to take advantage of this, 
but he's too dumb to pull it off. Uh, but realistically on the other end of that, there's the, the people like our friends that kind of got us into this because they started shit online a lot and didn't re and, and realistically, you notice the, the main culprit of that has pulled completely back on it. And I think that's because he's an intelligent person who was being an idiot Mm -hmm. and he finally realized, wow, this isn't actually helping anything. Uh, So there's that group of people. Now, include in that group the awfuls, which are the affluent white female liberals Mm. who want to look good, want to sound good, want to be compassionate, but they're not compassionate. They're just stupidly empathetic, which is different. We've gone over that. Go back to episode whatever. It's labeled compassion versus empathy. Uh, So there's that group of people. And realistically, if you want to think about it, that's who determines our president every year. That is, that is the group that keeps going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, so there, there, there's yeah. a reason one of our first episodes, there's a reason why I started out with Gustave Le Bon, who is a French psychologist who was really the founder of the idea of mob psychology. And, and um, I think I've referenced this before. I, I really should try and dig it up. I, there was a really good article a few years ago I don't remember which school shooting it was after that postulated that what we're seeing here is a slow motion mob psychology that is that is that is possible because of um, mass media that you no longer have to be in a crowd to be sucked into a crowd. You can do it virtually. The good and bad is that it's built on a, a house of cards. It, it, it's 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 a it's a paper it's it's paper walls, mm-hmm. and the bad of that was you can build a house of cards really quickly. Yeah, and, and it can take and it it can it can become very large very quickly, and you don't always know if it's going to be good or bad if it crashes down. The good news is it always crashes down, at some point, and that gets us to the subject of today, which is. Well, well that's why sure. I brought Let this up. Let me make up. sure I'm on the right tab before I... Because to me, this this reimagining of history is, or at least hopefully will be, a crashing down because it has reached peak absurdity. Well, it's less a reimagining of history that's bringing it down as a... There is no substance to it. So, yes, yes, there was an initial push, which... Unfortunately, a, a man had to die for that to happen. Uh, but this push was uh, was built on that, and it was an emotional reaction, but there was no actual substance behind it. And now we're just now, three years later, getting to the point where that is becoming public. I don't know when it started imploding, but this is uh, something. Uh, one of the stories we're going to bring up is about probably about it's three years old. About two years ago, it started imploding. So, hmm. what we have here, the first article I bring up is because to bring context here, this is written by the man in question on Politico. Past the fact in- that he is a professor of history tells you all you need to know about the state of history in academia. Well, I mean, he has a PhD and this is a relatively small university. So no. this is this is 2019. This is before he was famous. Now, he had already gotten acclaim for his first book, which was uh, stamped from the beginning up there, which is better than how to be an anti-racist. But at the same time, it's still a bunch of bullshit, uh, a, a long book about bullshit. So if you're going to actually just kind of get your your feet wet, do anti-racist. It's much shorter. Uh Pass an anti-racist constitutional amendment. This is this is what these people want to have done, especially this guy uh, at the forefront of it. And he's kind of been made a figurehead, you know, like you said, an idol earlier. But look at what they want to do. An amendment. This is a constitutional amendment he wants. An amendment would make unst- unconstitutional racial inequity, important word, inequity, over a certain threshold, as well as racist ideas by public officials. Now, he says in this little parentheses here, with racist ideas and public official clearly defined. Well, he wrote a whole book 
on what constitutes racist ideals, and he did not clearly define it. So I don't know who he's going to get, or who he's going to get to write the clear definition of racist ideas, uh, or what public official is. Yeah, but uh, the, he he didn't define what the late this is great the key Walter word, Williams. Though. The late great Walter Williams used to love to point out. So the NBA is racist, right? Because it's eighty percent black. No, but according to the ideology, though, you can't right. go the other way. Dude. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so they already covered that, that Walter Williams was old school. He was too old school. Uh, yeah, he, that now, if I remember correctly, Kendi grew up in affluent suburbs, right? No. Didn't he come from, he he wasn't, he wasn't from projects, but he wasn't from affluent suburbs either. He, he was kind of that in the middle, uh, kind of like that neighborhood where you would go visit a friend in San Antonio and you Mm. weren't afraid, but it also wasn't any kind of money either. the nicest of places okay yeah because yeah. walter williams you know him being called an uncle the guy grew up in in not just the projects but the projects of philadelphia okay he grew up in, in a time when crime was skyrocketing in the 60s and 70s that's where he comes from and so for for people like kindy to to you know, sneer and besmirch someone like Walter Williams. Screw you. You're a piece of trash. My only thing on, on just a slight side note to get back to the point, though, is if you're going to sneer and belittle somebody, you better be willing to debate them. Oh, yeah. And there's been plenty of what we would call black intellectuals on the not kindy side that have offered to debate him. And he will not because Mm -hmm. we will just misinterpret him. I'm like, that's Mm -hmm. the whole point of a debate is you Mm -hmm. clarify your position. But I I think racist ideas are going to basically be based on that word there. And timeline is fuzzy there. So what are you going to say? Everything has to be equitable in 10 years for this thing. Mm-hmm. yeah now we're getting that's the thing they say clearly defined but then they don't clearly define anything which has been one of the tactics from the beginning back to Saul Alinsky. uh and then they would appoint a department of anti-racism and it would be comprised comprised of formally trained experts and no political appointees so a private entity composed of formally trained experts, whatever that definition is, which would probably be people educated by him Mm -hmm. or the people that educated him, trained experts on racism and no political appointees. So therefore no accountability. We talk about the deep state and the problems with that, but there's also a big giant problem with an unfettered institution that is going to determine all policy by the public institution going into his further uh definitions there so this is written by him this lovely piece of work this uh all of a paragraph for political there there so he's he's putting in the work there yeah Uh, but but this is this is this is to, to give you the backdrop of who this this person is and what he wants to happen from what he does so fast forward 2020 george floyd gets uh brutally uh killed by Derek Chauvin and three other cops watching. Uh, Very unnecessary. You know, you could say what you want about why it was happening, but the fact that it happened, it was a very unfortunate situation. And uh, Chauvin was convicted, and that should have been the thing that stopped all riots, but that didn't happen. Uh, But let's fast forward. After that, huge sums of money are flowing into racial justice. Are they going to the right places? Actually, a pretty good, <laughs> a pretty good article right here. And this mm-hmm. is from uh, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, which we're actually going to come back to because we're going to get to another editorial that goes into more detail. And this one is pre, this one is July 2020. This is right before Kendi comes into prominence. And in uh, the next article is going to be a coming back and re-looking at everything. Uh, but the main thing here is, all these companies are doing this. Uh, it's a half a billion dollars. That's quite a bit to come from the private sector. And this one, you have to pay for the rest of the article. But the big worry here, and this is important when we come back to it, is they also worry that grant 
makers will overlook the small black-led grassroots organizations that will be crucial to creating systemic change, i.e. we actually fix the problems in these neighborhoods versus just virtue signaling. So we'll come back to that. So now we've got Ibram Kendi. He gets a lot of money in this whole process. So we said half a billion. He gets 10% of that or more for his uh, Boston University Center for Anti-Racism Research. Fast forward again, 2023. It's imploding. Why is it imploding? This is a left-leaning organization talking about it. Uh, everybody can see the link up top. Uh, this one talks about the layoffs uh, and... what they were hoping from it. And then just the fact that this is kind of a reboot of everything. Kendi comes out and says, this is not uh, this. He said, like many startups, we experienced rapid changes and yes, we made missteps, but I want to live in a world where all leaders of new organizations are given the time to make mistakes and learn and grow. Yes, that's true. Leaders of organizations should be able to learn and grow, but not at our expense. And they need to be accountable for what happened with that money. That yep. was my own editorial at the end. So this one was, was, yes, it exists. This problem is happening, but give them a pass. They opened up during COVID-19. He was new to this. All right. So then we go to the Washington Times, which this is a right-leaning organization. Oof, dang it, ads. And a little less friendly towards uh mr ibram x kendi or uh i think it's ibram henry rogers is his real name <laughs> uh, and uh so now we talk about the the uh he soaked donors for 50 million in contributions over the past three years while failing it seems to do much beyond enrich mr kendi defraud benefactors and terrorize low-level staff workers before firing them in mass so again a right leaning take on this uh where they use very inflammatory words like enrich mr kendi which he did make a lot of money but in his defense that was in speaking fees where he went and got additional money that weren't part of these grants uh, defraud benefactors and terrorize low-level staff workers. Now, there was indication that uh, apparently it was a very racist environment within the Anti-Racist oh, Research Center. Uh, Imagine that. So now we go to the original story on it, which is the Daily Free Press. It's an independent news letter for the Boston University. This is the person that first broke the whole thing. Uh, they hired Ibram Kendi to lead his new Center for Anti-Racist Research in 2020, a year marked by global pandemic and nationwide racial, racial tension. Again, the catalyst being George Floyd. Three years later, after at least $43 million in grants and gifts, and what sources say has been an, an underwhelming output of research, the Center of Anti-Racist Research laid off almost all of its staff last week. So this is... Uh, consistent with the last two articles, which were of di completely opposite political orientation. Uh, so we get, we're getting a little bit more of an unbiased view here. So they looked at the records, 43 million in uh, at least 43 million, 10 million coming from Twitter CEO, Jack Dorsey, as a well, uh, as well as donations for specific projects. Uh, they name a few more other famous donors tj maxx corporation so if anybody in the audience is the boycott type there you go uh stop and shop i don't know about that peloton i don't need that shit anyways uh overpriced yeah two thousand dollars with spin an bike. ipad on yeah, it yeah yeah uh which you can get a, a 200 dollars spin bike and put your ipad on the front because they come in with little carriers now and get on youtube and get a spin class for free if you're a spin class on YouTube, clip that and uh, uh, send us followers. Uh, <laughs> uh, ch -ch -ch. Let's see. I'm looking for. So okay, what's... here we go. This this okay, is this is this is the main thing. So this person Grundy, uh, she was the one I said left two years ago. So she left in 2021. 
uh, and she was one of the initial people that came on. She left because of an alleged alleged toxic work culture and grant grant mismanagement. And I don't remember if, if it was later in this article or in another article I read, she actually is a believer. She's one of the true believers. Mm. And the reason she left is they weren't doing anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where the grant mismanagement comes in. But because she actually spoke up because they weren't doing anything, she was the one that was being threatened of racist insults. And, you know, you combine this with the fact that these DEI trainings actually create a more toxic work environment. Well, it, it doesn't surprise me that the center for making that stuff is a toxic work environment. So the pattern of amassing grants without any commitment, sorry, any commitment to producing the research obligated to them, then continues to be a standard operating procedure for at the uh, the CAR. Okay, so I know you haven't worked in the scientific community, but I've done research. Getting a grant without any obligation to the research, you don't do this. This doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's not it's, supposed to happen. It's not supposed to happen unless your leverage is virtue signal. So basically what we got is a racket here. Mm. What that's, we got that's is a, exactly where I was going to go. Yeah. Yeah. What we have is a racket here. It's, uh, you know, we need this money for da, 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 da. Okay. What well, research are you going to do? And they say, George Floyd. Oh, you know what? Here's the money because something's going to come out against our company if we don't give you this money, right? Exactly. It, well, that's where I was going to go is is that there, there's two parts to the insidious nature of, of not just, you know, this, but things like this is one, you can't just say, well, it's 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 private people doing what they want with their own money. Well, except it's not because as you just pointed out, there's a good deal of coercion going on here. You know, uh, cue the clip of the the BlackRock CEO saying the quiet part out loud about how you have to quote force change on people. That's that's him saying out loud, "I'm a fascist and I unapologetically admit it." All right, so there's a good deal of coercion going on here. But two, it's not just private money, because there there's there's an interweaving of both private and public money here because this is at a public university so there is an inevitably also public money that is being used here and so these are people who want to coerce private money from people and then get free money by getting money from no questions asked government entities yeah, and I was doing a search for it and getting actual grant information is much more difficult than I thought. I thought it was all public record, but uh, it was you could get like a overall breakdown of Boston yeah. University, uh, what they received. Mm -hmm. But getting remember, I brought that one up from Connecticut or Harvard or one of one of them when it came to pharmaceuticals yeah. one time. Boston is not as upfront about theirs. They just well, give I you a graph and it's like, here's what we get, how much money we got total. And I'm like. No, I want to see this mm -hmm. one department and where they're getting their money from because I want to see how much of that is public money. I get if into Jack this Dorsey back in... wants to give ten million dollars. That's Jack Dorsey's decision. Yes. yes. If if the NIH is giving ten million dollars, that's my money. I got I got it. I went down this rabbit hole in like 2015, 2016 when I was looking into and, and writing about the Clinton Foundation because it's not just corporate money that goes into the clinton foundation they get money because they're a they're an ngo they get money from the state department they get money from the government to to you know for earthquake relief in haiti and yet they are so opaque that i looked at a half dozen or more uh watchdogs who whose entire purpose is to scrutinize nonprofits. And then let people know this is where your money is going. This is how much of your donation actually goes to the 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 cause that it's supposed to go to. They don't know when it comes to the Clinton Foundation because they are so opaque that the best guess of a number of these watchdog organizations is that maybe 10% of the money that goes into the Clinton Foundation actually 
actually goes into charity. Yeah, we're getting to that. Uh, did my calculator come up when I when I have share screen, or does it not come up? No, no. It's okay, all so go between tabs here. Yeah, so I I calculated. So we go down a couple a uh, couple paragraphs here. Mm. BU is defending themselves, Boston University. We uh, have an 8% 8 increase in black enrollment over the past five years as of 2020 to 2021. Pause a second there, because I mentioned the late, great Walter Williams. And something he pointed out repeatedly is that these universities, especially like the Ivy League types, love to point out their percentage of black enrollment. They ignore the percentage of black graduates. Yes, yeah. So that that's a whole discussion in itself, mm -hmm. uh, and we we talk about uh, that's an affirmative action talk, yeah. I think, because it's uh, you, you, you want to set people up for success, yep, as much as possible, as well as get the numbers you want, and if everything works out properly and you're doing the right things, you will get the proper numbers by setting people up for success. But that's not what's happening in a lot of these affirmative action programs. Mm -hmm. uh, but specific to the thing we're talking about, 8% increase, that's 8% over what they were already doing. And what it says shows later is, oh, in the next paragraph, their current is 4.8%. So we're talking uh, 8%. 8% of 4.8%, not 8% total. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is this well, is even the, even less than that, because eight percent of what was before four point eight percent, four percent, four point eight percent. But I did now. I did the math on in the current paragraph. They're they're boasting the they're reporting that uh, of the three thousand thirty faculty members, there are seventy one black female instructors. <laughs> what percentage is that? That's what I did the math on. It's pretty Not damn low. Yeah. Two point three four. 2.34%. Okay. Now that is female. So if we assume a one-to-one, -one, which in today's day, it's actually probably more females than males, but we'll just give it, give them the benefit of that. Assuming a one-to-one, -one, that's five, that's less than 5% black faculty. All right. So this is, this is not the end of the story. We're going to get nuanced here. I'm going to, I'm going to cut down every argument against what I'm talking about as I'm talking about it. So about 5% faculty, 4.8% is the total student population that's black. Uh, so actually faculty to, to student population is pretty dang close. But what is it compared to Massachusetts in general? I'm assuming that's where we're gonna get, they're gonna get most of their- Question. That's where we're gonna, they're gonna get most of their uh, people from. Whoops. Well, the, 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 okay, the, the second line here says it won't let me highlight one line. Here, what, what's the national? Is it, it? It's somewhere around 15%. 14, right at 14. 14. Right at okay. four, like 14.1 or something like that. So there's our percentage. So they're at half of the percentage of the population in the state they're recruiting from. Now, Boston University is pretty prestigious, so it's going mm -hmm. to recruit from multiple states. But at the same time, you're going to get the majority of students from those close by just because yeah. – that's how college recruiting works. Yeah, it's mostly going to come from New England. Yeah, yeah. So nine points. So we're we're at half. So even after this big giant push, where over fifty million dollars has gone into it, we're still at a low faculty number, and we're still at a a, a, a negative when it comes to equity faculty faculty number when it comes to students. And just to give a comparison. This is California, which everybody thinks, oh, they're so diverse. Yeah, 6.5% black, by the way. Less diverse when it comes to that than most of the country. Uh, this is Texas. We are right at about national average because we're probably the most diverse state in the country. I, I believe, if I remember correctly, Irving, Texas is the most diverse place in the country because it is a quarter each of the the major um uh ethnicities uh, i did white, not know that black uh texican and asian i did not know that because i'm actually in a minority majority area being in southern houston so those that know harris county know that we're a minority majority uh now all of texas is that 13.4 but that includes like uh 
Midland and Abilene and the mm-hmm. Panhandle, mm-hmm. which are going to be majority white, mm-hmm. uh, and my area, which is majority black, and somewhere like San Antonio, which is majority Hispanic, and then Dallas, which is kind of like that right there hub of yep. everything. Uh, and then we'll look at the other end of that. We'll look at Louisiana, where they're about triple the national average. So Massachusetts, we were, I was trying to be fair because I was like, you know what? Maybe they're 3% black, like something somewhere like Oklahoma is mm-hmm. like 3 or 4% black. I was going to say, okay, so maybe it's a recruiting thing by geography. But no, it's not a recruiting thing by geography. So you've lost your excuse. Sorry, Ibram X. Kindy. Uh, but uh, so, so they, they're doing bad when it comes to the faculty. They're doing bad when it comes to the student. What is this money going to? Uh, realistically, that's the thing. There's nothing this money is going to. It's just going. Mm-hmm. And that's where we're at. And there's a big inquiry into it. And the problem is the person, the person, the people in charge of the inquiry are Boston University. So they get to investigate themselves. Yep. But to quote the chief of staff, Copeland, it's a real mess. There are no real winners here. Gee, imagine that. (laughs) Imagine that. And then this is just more details on the layoffs and, uh, this is this one stuck out at me because what one of the things they were supposed to do was create a a lab a data lab to map all the inequities across the country and so far we've gotten nothing from that and there's only two possibilities for getting nothing after 3 years one is nobody's working the other is they don't they're like not the getting, data and they don't want to publish They're not it. getting the numbers they want and they don't want to publish yeah. it. Yeah. So so those are the two possibilities there. Well, uh, he, here's the racket that a lot of people don't really fully understand. And this is where where I get infuriated with um uh public money and and uh professional politicians and fundraising is it's you know people like to point out like the United Way is one of these uh charities that that there's i don't remember the number off the top of my head so i won't say but it's not a very good percentage that actually goes to the charity uh yeah and i'm trying to remember the list it's it's the top two worst are susan b coleman and mm -hmm. wounded warrior project And, and and people will point out things like the the number of executives who make six figures right okay but that's that's just the easiest thing to point out as a single number where it becomes insidious is that if you are doing the business of the ngo well then you can use those funds okay so um uh the the clinton foundation because i brought it up earlier is they'll say well you know we don't you know we bill and hillary we don't take money from the foundation okay well you don't take a salary from the foundation that doesn't mean you don't use their money if you're going to speak on behalf of the clinton foundation if you're going to a clinton foundation fundraiser then that travel that hotel those meals all of those living expenses come from the clinton the, the clinton foundation uh, uh uh revenue it's paid for by the clinton foundation So same thing with fundraising is the reason politicians spend so much time fundraising and are able to live above the meet their means besides the fact that they have nasty things like they're exempt from insider trading laws is because if you're always campaigning, then you can always use your campaign money. You never have to pull out your own credit card. That's what's going on here is that it's not just how much was Kindy being paid to be the director of this thing is how much were they expensing for, you know, just the normal daily activities that they would do of we're going to have a, you know, a, a, a anti-racism, you know, dinner where we're going to discuss important things and then we never have to pay for our own dinner. 
you can rack up $50 million pretty quick there. If you've got, you know, 50 to a hundred people that you're, you're constantly, you know, funding to do daily life stuff. And that's where these people are able to live on free money without doing actual work. Or doing work and being overpaid for it. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the other insidious part of this is that there's no accountability mechanism. So I, I recently had an infuriating, um, I've been, I've been feeling pretty crappy lately in large part because I, I pushed off my, my pain management stuff that I have to do yearly because I was so busy in the summer. I usually, I had been doing it early in the summer and I thought, well, I'll just wait till the end of summer. Well, when it started to go downhill, it, it snowballed fast. And then on top of that, stupid insurance company is jerking me around and it took me six weeks to actually get in and have the procedure, the first of a, a few procedures, it took me six weeks to get in because I was having to go back and forth with them. Why? Well, because they're evil. Well, no, it's because there's no accountability because I'm not the customer. And and this is a this is a rant for another time if you really want to go down this rabbit hole. But one of the big problems with health care in the United States is that it's based off of health insurance and health insurance is based off of your employer for the most part, which means you're not the customer. So I, I'm not the customer. And, and even my wife isn't even the customer. It's her employer that is the customer. So what do they care if I complain? What do they care if she complains? Uh, it's It's deeper than that because... So our uh, lovely, esteemed, compassionate uh, lawmakers decided to limit the insurance companies, and they did so in the most deceptively devious way they possibly could, and they capped them at a percentage. Mm -hmm. They can only make 15% above their pre premiums, uh, or excuse me, they can only make 15% above their payouts in premiums. Well, the deceptive part, you know, someone, some lay person that just doesn't care about math or even anything, they say, oh, they limited them. That's great. Awesome. Cool. They use percent. Mm -hmm. And so what is 15% of a hundred dollars? $15. What is 15% of $200? $30. $30. Yeah, so, so if... Uh, a, a provider charges me $200, I can make $30. Or if a provider charges me $100, I can make $15. There you go. That's where your insurance premiums come from because they can make more money if the provider charges more money. And then they do these stupid negotiating tactics is why you get the, the bill in the mail after you've already settled everything. Mm -hmm. And then you have to call into arbitration because arbitration just says, oh, you don't know anything. But the insurance company goes by the initial bill in the next negotiating process. So it's it's a giant scheme. It's called fascism, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. It's when the government and uh, corporations are working together uh, to. Uh... Why? Because they want to they want to separate themselves from the customer because then because then they don't have to be responsive to the customer they can get free guaranteed money from the government. Yeah, and and you want to say that the, the second, the, what you were talking about is the second layer of disconnect. So mm -hmm. now you're paying your premiums through your employer who is charging you a certain amount of that. Yes. And that they're is, paying that is certain... That is an important point that a lot of people like skip right over. It's, oh, well, I get free healthcare. No, you don't. That's That's compensation. If your if your employer didn't have to provide all of those uh, benefits, they would just give you more money. Exactly. Yeah. That that be money would be because they would your... have to to attract you to their business. Yeah. And even if you had a medical savings account type option, which I think we got in Texas, what fifteen years ago, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That would actually, if if medical costs could stay down, that would be a viable option because. 
Now, yes, you're not getting it in your paycheck and it goes into this account to, to be used for, for healthcare, but it's not subject to this negotiation process and this profit margin because it skips the health insurance company. And again, this is not me pooping on capitalism, which people talk about with health insurance. It's me poop, pooping on the crony capitalism of the insurance companies in bed with the government to make this process where they can make more profits. Uh, what's 600 times 12? That is $7,200. $7,200 a year I pay for my health insurance, approximately. That's just me. That's not my son or my wife as well. So $7,200 a year. Uh, that could go a long way to other things. Mm -hmm. That would almost pay for my schooling for the year. Pretty good chunk there. But uh, yeah, we, we got derailed though. Where was I going? Well, the, I, well I'm curious. Oh, we were talking about the, the difference in charities. That's what we were talking about, right? Yes, it is. And the, the racket here is because, you know, I've, I've, I, I keep, I brought up the late, great Walter Williams. So I'll keep bringing him up is that um, the older I get and the more cranky and libertarian I get because, you know, Walter Williams or, you know, one, one of his, his predecessors, Milton Friedman, one of the things they said frequently that is being proven more and more true every day is that the point of government is to fix problems it created and then make more problems so that it can fix those problems down the road so that it can perpetuate itself. Yeah. And the problem is the actual, the fact that the people that are making the decisions profit from the decisions. Mm -hmm. That's the major problem. I At have the I have no of problem who have no interest in what they're doing. Yeah, I have no problem with government regulation of industry within reason. Uh, it's when the government, the people in charge of that government, benefit from that regulation where we have the problem, and that's that's why someone who's polarizing, like Matt Gates, is actually becoming a, a libertarian national hero right now. Because all he's asking for in this whole thing that would threaten the shutdown and everything is single item bills where we're not getting omnibus bills. Mm -hmm. uh, and what was the other thing? Oh, term. Was it term limits? No, I he wants term limits, but I don't think that was part of that. This. wasn't part of the deal. It was. Uh, but the main thing was the single item bill. Yes. Uh, that, that really pushed him in. And realistically he was trying to block the, the the extra funding for ukraine which now that we've got another altercation pulling out how much money are we going to send everywhere right mm -hmm. uh but yeah he's becoming kind of a little little bit of a libertarian even someone like jimmy Dore was praising him the other day and he's as lefty as you can get uh but he's tired of the establishment mm -hmm. but he's a lefty who gets it Mm -hmm. You know, he believes in the in the huge social safety net. He believes in universal health care. He believes in all those things that some lefties propose. But he also understands that the machine isn't letting it happen because what we call lefties in Congress are not lefties. And uh, yeah, well, the same, uh, thing goes, the same thing goes for the right. It's the unibrow, the uniparty. Uh, sorry, was that triggering? Was that a microaggression to mention unibrow? Hey, hey, I keep it nice and trim, my friend. <laughs> I have been plucking this thing for twenty years. Your sisters taught me how to do it right, too. By the way, so I, I don't know if that, that I don't know if they know from experience or I'll let, not. I'll, 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 uh, I'll shots let them know fired. That you're thankful. Yeah. Hey, I taught Ben too because he he uh, uh, inherited it from me. So. Oh no. Yeah, and it actually looks worse on him than it did on me. So <laughs> he's so Aryan. How could you even see it? I don't know. It just, it just grows thick in the middle there. But uh, the great thing is my hair is graying now. So what the new stuff that grows out is gray. So I get away with it a little bit longer. <laughs> it's not as, it's not as obvious. Uh, okay. So this is the last one on this subject. Uh, this is from that same philanthropy chronicle that I brought up earlier. And this is the post hoc one. And this one I, I found very intriguing because he starts by going into why he was denied for certain grants. 
and it wasn't anything political. It was, you know, uh, it was uh, things like, oh, your organization lacks this in setup. We see failures coming forward. We see this kind of strategic uh, issue mm -hmm. coming up. And uh, so they went back to the drawing board in the story, just to fast forward through and kind of adjusted everything, made everything more detailed, had a better business plan. They got cons consultants on the way to make sure that everything was going to go through and they got the grants they needed and proceeded with their funding and did their good work. Right. So that's how it's supposed to work. And this article was how, because of the emotional aspect of everything going on kindy was able to bypass all of that because had there been this process involved none of this stuff would be happening right now even bad research is productive research because at least you support a null hypothesis right i just had a thought but go ahead and and, and finish up yeah so so we're going through and he, he brings up the details of it. And I can't remember if it was this or one of his sources also brought up Black Lives Matter. And uh, the, the side point there is of the $90 million, which would be almost double what Kendi got. So 20%. So we are already counting for 10 and 20% of all the money gone into social things from philanthropists after the George Floyd thing. Only six million was accounted for, and that was in the houses of the founders. <laughs> Everything else, there's no red tape to, or there's no, there's no uh, receipts to anything positive that has happened from that. So that one's even a bigger grift than what we're talking about. But uh, I don't even think we need to even go into that. It's so bad. Uh, but yeah, he, he just goes into the details of, of how it lacked a sound plan. Huge amounts of cash came in. There was no management. Uh, there was no uh, obligation to fulfill anything from the money that came in, which is huge. If yeah. I if I apply for a grant, so say say my research to to connect personality type to to body pain issues that I've uh, I've written my proposal about is is considered then whoever gives the grant money to uhcl for this to go through which it wouldn't be much because it could be all survey data but yeah. even still that little bit of money will be freaking itemized and micromanaged to make sure every bit of that went towards the research and a product came out the other end and i did poster, poster presentations and all of these things that go through with that None of that happened. Uh, to reiterate a point I made earlier when I brought up the Washington Times, conservative media has taken this and lampooned it, which is not helpful. We need to stick with the merits, but that doesn't get you headlines. Uh, and then he goes into needing for new di due diligence, but then he finishes with an anecdote of his friend who is, here we go. A friend of his who is, what did we bring up in the last article, someone who runs one of these Black-led startup organizations that run actual grassroots community improvement efforts that this money actually would have been very useful for. And he, he, he talks about the staff, they don't take salaries. They're all volunteers, so they can funnel every bit of money into the projects they actually have going. They're organized. And they actually have purpose and they got nothing. And so they got less than 1% of the money that was raised by all of these emotional things going forward. And uh, I think we can end with Kendi is the real tragedy here is not what didn't get done by the organizations that received the money, but what could have been accomplished by those who did. Who didn't, excuse me. It, we call that opportunity cost. So it th 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 this is a this is a problem in economics. It's not enough to say, well, but you know, yeah, we we weren't able to accomplish the thing that we wanted with this money, but at least we did this. No, but th no, 
what could you have done with that money if it didn't go there? Well, and that's you the problem. Can't... They can't even say, but we did this. They did nothing. Mm -hmm. They did negative. If you really want to break it down, you know, I talked about the, 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 the conservative media lampooning this. They did negative work. Because now anything that is considered anti-racist research or whatever, even if it's legitimate, like these grassroots organizations, are going to be looked at sideways and nobody's going to give them money because this person squandered their money. Uh -huh. And some people are trying to say, well, he was a person thrust into this situation uh, that how could you not refuse if because you became the face of all of this? Two answers to that. First of all, from a business perspective, you know what? I had trouble delegating because I was living paycheck to paycheck with my business. But if you got $50 million, mm -hmm. you can hire a business planner. Mm -hmm. You can hire an administrator that understands how to and, run. And if you actually a, care a about what you're supposedly doing there, you will listen to that person. When that person says, okay, this is what you want to accomplish. So these are the steps we need to take. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, look, I understand that I'm the face of this. You're going to get this nice salary to make it worth something. Mm -hmm. That That's that's the thing. You, you say, you know what? You're not going to get any fame from this, but you're going to be really freaking comfortable. I trust it in your hands. And that would have been better than what happened. What happened was nothing other than the person on top mm -hmm. doing public. And he even there's there's even a new book coming up, which is how to be a in quotes, young anti-racist. Oh, geez. Which I read the description of it and it's the exact same book as how to be an anti-racist. He describes his bringing up and changing of his views as he goes through adolescence or childhood, adolescence and young adulthood. And I'm like, that's actually how to be an anti-racist. That's the same book. They, what he probably did was wrote the same book and took the parts out that were criticized. Like when he said white people must be aliens and his roommate had to correct him because he's stupid. No, this is All legitimate. Right. He actually thought white people were aliens because we he <sighs> thought we were so different. I, I can get the book and read you the passages if you want. Well, let's this, this is, I'm going to quote Glenn Lowry here because I think he's got the the best description of Kendi. I wanted to say he's dumb, but that dumb is not a good insult anymore because it's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's been used so much that what Glenn Lowry says is he's an empty suit, man. He, well, he's you know empty what? Suit. That, that fits perfectly with what I was thinking while you were talking, which was the reason this didn't work is because Kendi is an influencer. He's nothing more than an Instagram butt model. Uh, the, the, the word I used at the very beginning of this, there was no substance. There was a face with no mm -hmm. substance. Okay. So, and <clears throat> the, the thought I had, right. So let me figure out how to unpack this. Okay. So one of the, one of the, the, the tracks of this thought is apparently uh, Kennedy said something recently where he used the term stakeholder, uh, which is a bad term. However, I don't think he meant it in the way that people like Elizabeth Warren mean it when they and and the Black Rocks of the world mean it when they when they talk about stakeholder capitalism instead of shareholder capitalism. And while I was listening to this, it suddenly dawned on me of what a bastardization of that term that is. Because when yeah, people, it's one of those things that has different meanings, and one is positive, and one is what's being well, used. Right, and when people yeah. like Warren and the Black Rocks of the world use it, it's a lie. Because the people they're talking about don't actually have a stake in what is going on. Why? Because they haven't invested in anything. Why do you charge, besides the fact that you need to, you know, that you have bills you have to pay, why do you charge for personal training? Because if you didn't, they wouldn't show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, what I would like to say is, uh, we can go back to Thomas Sowell here, it's trade-offs. So yes, I have a stake in the environment, but I also have a stake in energy costs. Mm -hmm. So I have a stake in both of those things. And the problem is they're choosing my stake for me. Yes. They're choosing. That's a good point. 
they're choosing the fact that I can run my business or my household effectively because I can afford the energy to do so versus my stake in it warming up a degree in the next 20 years, 40 years, 50 years. I'm going to take much better care of my car because I paid for it. That money came out of my bank account than the car my parents gave me to use, which is why they gave me a beat up old piece of used junk. Mm hmm. Right. So one of the infuriating things about some of the articles you were sharing there is, and this is the other track where where this this train of stakeholder goes. Have you ever heard of microfinance? I've heard of micro, but not microfinance. Okay. Microfinancing, micro loans. Not micro, but micro. Oh, the way you separated that, I I I said Mike Rowe in my head, and I was thinking Dirty Jobs <laughs> guy, and I was like, is this a term he made up or no, 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 micro, so, micro is in M I C R O, yeah, micro. <laughs> okay, so th- this is something I learned about through my dad before I actually learned about the the technical term, and then when I was in grad school. By the way, I, I have heard of micro financing. <laughs> okay, I did so not I, hear of Mike Rowe financing. <laughs> so I, <laughs> one of the guys in one of my grad school classes was was from Mexico, and he was very familiar because, um, I took a course where there was a lot of different disciplines that came in. I was from history. He was from business school. We had people from sociology and, and political science in, in this class. Anyway. So he was really into microfinancing because it was a big deal in Mexico and Latin America. And I said, oh, I have heard of this before. I just hadn't heard of it in these terms because my dad had contributed to uh, basically, which if you know my dad, this makes perfect sense. It's this, it's this charitable organization that gives cows to people, okay? But they don't just give them away. Why? Because you have to have a stake so that you actually invest your time and energy and you actually care. Okay. So what they do is they, they, they sell basically at cost, uh, milk producing cows and goats to people in third world countries so that they can create a home business. And then, and then they can, they can generate dairy products that they can sell to their neighbors and then they can pay off and then pay it forward because then the then someone else will be able to get the the uh, the offspring from that animal and so i was like oh i have heard of these things before so the microfinancing is a thing that annoyingly doesn't work very well in the united states because we have such an overburdening regulatory body when it comes to finance that most of the time microfinance is done through charitable organizations, a lot of time through churches, because they have found, the people who do this have found that you can't just give these things away. But so like if you need a business loan because you need a, you know, uh, your garage caught fire, you need to rebuild it and you need to repurpose your equipment. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars okay so a bank here in america they will give you that business loan they will issue that business loan they will look at your your business plan they will look at your revenue and they will say okay this is worth it we will make a profit here we have a good chance of making a profit if we give this business loan to this person they cannot make a profit if i say i need a 50 dollars loan to buy a goat Okay, so this is what microfinance does in third world countries. The 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 organizations and places that were referenced in in those articles that you talked about, that's what they try to do to get around all of these overhead and these regulatory costs to help people directly. But they aren't able to do it as often because one, you have these government regulatory burdens, and two, you have the Ibram X Kindies of the world who are getting $50 million to just throw money around and say, we're helping. But they're not actually, they don't actually have a stake because the people that were referenced in that last article, those are almost certainly people who live in that community, who grew up in that community. It's a church that services that community. It's a, it's a, 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 a charter school that, that services the children of that community. They know who needs what and what they need. 
And this is because to, let me let me sock you back all the way to the beginning of this where you brought up a question for me uh, that is relevant here. And I think it's going to tie it all together because we're at an hour and five minutes for this first section here. You asked about the CRT movement and what they have and what are the people behind it and everything. It's all about power. The basis of the critical theories is power dynamics. And the part of it they don't say out loud is we want the power. What they what they what they preach is if we can eliminate the power and the people oppressing you, then everything's going to be good. But what they really mean is if you give us the power, we'll get revenge. Then we'll get revenge. That this is where it becomes individual. Some people think they can help everybody if they got the power, but it's the age old, the power corrupts, ultimate power ultimately corrupts. Right. But the, the people that want the power are the people soaking it all up or the people that want to help are the not the ones not getting it, not getting the money. So the people that want the money to help aren't getting it. The people that want the money for power are getting it because they know how to play the game. Mm. And this person played the emotional game, got the power. Notice who didn't get fired. 30 of like 60 people got fired. There's one person that didn't get fired and he's still the number one there because he's the person that gets more money flowing in because he writes the books, which again, the next, I just brought up the next book is going to be the same book. Uh, it's but again probably a lie about his past in this one because he got criticized but so many things he thought in his past on the other one uh but yeah it's all about the power he wants the power to regulate our government i brought that up in the very first article i brought yeah. up with him he who do, who do you think is going to be the head of this private entity that governs our government it it ain't gonna be it's gonna be him or someone that he trained yeah, yeah, it ain't going to be Walter Williams. Well, he's dead. It ain't going to be Thomas Sowell. It ain't going to be John McWhorter. It ain't going to be, it, it won't even be Cornell West. <laughs> because Cornell West is actually a reasonable critical theorist. Because he's a true believer. So he's, we can't have that. Well, he he's he believes he can rationalize it. Yeah. And so he gets he gets bogged down in those rationalization argument arguments instead of just saying. Well, you can't argue with me because you don't understand, which is what the other ones do. He actually gets in the trenches, which means that there is a compromise of ideas at some point. A true believer that will get in the trenches will actually come out to a better result than a true believer that won't engage. But but yeah, it's it, it was, Angela Davis would probably be a candidate for the top of that. You know, Miss Friend of Jim Jones, Miss BLM uh, advisor would probably be the head of an organization like that. You want that? Let's see what BLM did, right? What happened in Jonestown? Uh, yeah. I think that's a good place to end. <laughs> what happened in Jonestown? Uh, uh, the, the Rageaholic, I referenced his channel before. He has a very good video on if you don't know, he's got like a, it's only like 10 or 15 minutes long. It's a very eye opening video if you don't know the history of that because it's it's even worse than you think it is because people just think, oh, cyanide Kool Aid. No, it's even worse than that. Well, but they don't, yeah. Th and I don't know if he addresses this in that video because I haven't watched it, but the, the realization is the cyanide Kool Aid came out because so many people started wanting to leave exactly that was that was the problem if everybody had stayed kumbaya they'd still be kumbaya no but it's, the yeah yeah the fact mm -hmm. that it got to a point and the, the internal there's always going to be conflict no matter where you are it just takes on different forms or comes on in di at different times and what happened was there started to be internal conflict some people were like this is not right they wanted to leave and so he killed everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 330 something million people, that's not going to happen as far as Kool-Aid. But you can have a societal collapse. And that's that's exactly the same result. No, we don't have Kool-Aid. We just have died suddenly. 
But I digress. Let's not go into that. Okay. <laughs> no, I was thinking more of uh, this, this, what do they call it? Fifth generation civil war stuff that people talk about where it's just going to be so divided that the whole whole thing falls apart. All right. Well, on that cheery note, we'll, uh, that'll be the end of part one. Let's, let's pause here. Sa- sadly, this is actually more cheery than what we're about to talk about in oh, part two. Geez. Yeah, that's true. All right. We love you guys. If you're here for the wheel of time uh, episode episode, then that'll be part two. If you stuck with us this long, please like share, subscribe. Uh, Yeah. No. And we know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but we at least know it's going to be someone's cup of tea. And that's the great thing about YouTube is out of millions of people that can see this, you know, if we, if we get it in front of as many people as possible, then uh, we're, we're, Every time I think of, I come up with an idea that's new, I find it somewhere else. That's the same thing here. It, mm. We're we're saying things that we think are original, but other people are thinking them in their heads. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, hopefully they can piggyback on it and, and hit the comments, man. We need comments. Give us topics. That's another yes. thing because because we do kind of banter about what we're going to talk about. And when when we get together and get drunk, we talk about a lot of things. But the problem is we were drunk, so I never remember them. Yeah. Uh, that's true. We, we talked a lot the last time you were here when we were fishing and mm-hmm. I was the whole time I was like, Oh, that's a great topic. Oh, we need to do that. And then that Monday morning after you left, I was like, what did we talk about? What did we talk about? It was good, yeah. whatever it was. So yeah. So yeah, just uh, do all those things that help with social media. Uh, we're, we're not attention hogs, but uh, attention is good for business. So, uh, so yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and also if, if, if you're listening this long, you at least agree with something. So let's get it out there. All right. We'll see y'all next time.